sisters, we continue our study, our meditation from the Gospel of Mark. And this morning we have come to Mark chapter 6. And I'm going to call your attention to Mark chapter 6, the first six verses of this chapter. Now, brothers and sisters, when you turn to the Holy Bible, you will find there in the Holy Bible four Gospel accounts. You find Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And some people have this wrong idea that there are four Gospels just as there were four volumes, the records of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You need four volumes of four Gospel accounts because if that would be the most complete account of a total record of every words that Jesus spoke and everything that Jesus did and every a town and every person that the Lord Jesus Christ might have, might have um, uh, met in during his earthly ministry. That is not the reason why there are four Gospels in account in the, in the Holy Bible. The four Gospel writers, brothers and sisters, they are not recording everything that took place in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, they were all, each one of them, writing to different people during the time that they were alive and then they record the four gospel for our instruction. Each one of them, each one of them, of the gospel writer, they would select incidents that would support their individual purpose in writing their gospel account. And so here, if you turn to the gospel of John, for example, and chapter 20, gospel of John chapter 20, you will read there in verses 30 to 31 how, Paul, uh, how John gave his reason, his purpose for composing the Gospel of John. He's, he wrote there in John 20 verse 30. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, the Gospel of John. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. And so here you find John giving his stated purpose that he had an a, 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 a intention, the author, authorial uh, intent in writing the gospel that has come to be known as the gospel of John. Similarly, as we are now studying the gospel of Mark, you find Mark had a purpose in everything that he chose to include in his 16 chapters here in the Gospel of Mark. So far you have seen how Mark calls your attention to the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have seen, brothers and sisters, how he showed you that Christ has power over the forces of nature. He has shown you with examples how Christ has power over unclean spirits and demons and even the devil. You have seen, brothers and sisters, how Christ has power over human diseases and illnesses and sicknesses. Now, brothers and sisters, what is the purpose of Mark in calling your attention to all these things about the Lord Jesus Christ? These powers that was displayed by our Lord Jesus Christ during His public ministry in this world. Well, brothers and sisters, what do you learn? from all these things about the power displayed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, you see, Mark wanted to convince you. Mark wanted to show you. Mark wanted you to see, brothers and sisters, that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Mark is actually calling you to ponder on this point. For example, in chapter 1 of Mark, in verse 24, that the Lord Jesus Christ is indeed the Holy One of God. Chapter 3 and verse 11, that the Lord Jesus Christ is none other than the Son of God who has become man. And there in chapter 5 and verse 7, you find the, the purpose of Mark is to call your attention to this, the identity of our Lord as the Son of the Most High God. Now brothers and sisters, are you getting this? Are you convinced by Mark? You see Mark? He quoted all these examples that took place in the lifetime of our Lord Jesus Christ on earth. He wanted to show to you with all these incredible proofs, factual proof, historical data and details in order to 
convince you to think deeper and higher in order to call you, brothers and sisters, to draw you to ask the important question, what does it mean? Who is this man? And come to the conclusion that he is none other than God in human flesh. Do you believe, brothers and sisters, in the things that the Gospel of Mark recorded for you? Are you convinced by all these things that the, the writer of Mark has uh, quoted for you and recorded for you? Will you come this morning, brothers and sisters? Do you find that you are able to come and trust and call upon the name of this wonderful person, the lovely person of Jesus Christ, who did all these things to relieve those who were in misery and captive by demons and misery and pains and sicknesses? Will you come and trust Him yourselves and give your wholehearted devotion to Him and call Him your Lord and your Savior and give your utmost, give your whole life to Him to serve Him and to become someone who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, you this morning in this chapter, you find our Lord Jesus Christ back in his hometown of Nazareth. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 tells us that the hometown of our Lord is Nazareth. For you we are told that in Luke 4 and verse 16, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And so we know that he was back at this point in his hometown of Nazareth. And here in these six verses, brothers and sisters, you learn three very heartwarming lessons from our Lord and about our Lord. Firstly, you learn here, brothers and sisters, that our Lord is fully man. And that is evidently what you learn here in chapter 6, verse 2 to verse 3. Let me read for you once again. He says, And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man, this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hand? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? And brother of James, also Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Now, brothers and sisters, what is the purpose of Mark in recording all these conversations that took place, that came from the lips of the neighbors and the, the people in the hometown of our Lord Jesus Christ? You see here, brothers and sisters, Mark wanted you to learn this, that the Lord Jesus Christ was a man, is a man, and he is not just a man, he is a man with a human mother, with brothers and sisters, just like you, and just like every other human being. Not only, only do you find a mention of his immediate family members, you are also told or that there were people in his hometown, his neighbours. Those people who have seen the Lord Jesus Christ growing up from a boy into a man, from a young child who knew nothing, playing around in the streets and in a hometown with his neighbors. And now today he has come back as the rabbi who claimed to be the Messiah. Now what do all these things tell you? And what is the purpose of Mark in calling your attention to look at all these words and all these things that were spoken by the neighbors and by this portion here he recorded for us. You see, what you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of Mark to recount all these details? Mark, as I told you just now, has shown you that Christ is God. And now, he is calling your attention to this thing that he wants to show you that Christ is also fully man. And that is very important for you to take note. Sometimes we elevate the divinity of Christ so highly that we forget the very same time that the man who was crucified on the cross of Calvary, he was not just the Son of God, he was also fully man. The Son of Mary, the brother of James and all the others mentioned here in this list by the neighbors. Mark is teaching you something incredible. Mark started off by showing to you that Christ had power over the forces of nature, of sicknesses, and even of un 
an unclean spirit. But now he brings you back to this, that the Lord Jesus Christ is not only God in this display of incredible power and authority, but that he is also a man with human connections. He has a family, brothers and sisters. He's teaching you that Christ is fully God and fully man in one person. Well, do you believe this, brothers and sisters? Are you able to identify with what Mark is trying to show you? That a person who died for his people on the cross of Calvary, the same person who said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This the God-man, Jesus Christ. He must be God. Because only God can fully satisfy the offense that we have committed against God. But at the very same time, he must be man. Because only man can save man. And can represent man. The animal sacrifice of ancient time can never pay for the sins of human beings. They are only meant to be visual aids and object lessons. To remind us of the promise that God will one day send the Savior, His own Son, to die for the sins of those who are His people. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so here we are told by Mark that the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and here fully man. And as a man, brothers and sisters, you find that the Lord Jesus Christ had the same human relationship. You have a mother. He has a mother. You have brothers and sisters in a normal family, unless you are a single child. You find that the Lord Jesus Christ had brothers and sisters, not half-brothers and half-sisters, full brother, full sister from the same mother, even the, the, the Mary, as we have mentioned here. And he... Because he has a human family, he also faced the same human problems that you face. You will have siblings problem, you will have quarrels among your family, you will have people who will not believe you, will not, cannot tolerate you, cannot accept you for who you claim to be or want to be. Look at what you are told there in chapter 6 of Mark and verse 4. A prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, hometown or in, among his neighbors, among not just his neighbors, but among his own relatives, uncles and aunties, and uh, relative cousins and nephews and nieces and all, and in his own family. So we are told here, the Lord Jesus Christ had all this human connection when he was with us in this world. These people would be very hard and difficult to convince the Lord Jesus Christ was rejected by them and they were offended by Him because He claimed to be the Son of God. How can He be the Son of God? He grew up among us. I carried Him, you know. I carried Him when He was a boy. I played with Him. We went to the same river to swim. We climbed the same tree. And now He comes back and He claimed to be the Son of God and that He came to, to be the Messiah. We cannot accept that. They had no problem accepting that he was among them, that he was a child, that he had a mother, and he had brothers and sisters. They had no problem accepting that. Because they knew Mary, they knew brothers and sisters of our Lord. But not when he claimed to be the Son of God, the promised Savior of the world. Not only the neighbors and the relatives had problem accepting that. Even his own family members did not believe in him. When he claimed to be the Son of God and the Savior of the world. For in John, as I told you before, in the Gospel of John, chapter 7 and verse 5, we are told, For even his brothers did not believe in him. Not only that, you remember in the Gospel of Mark that we have studied, Mark chapter 5 and verse 21, if you turn back to Mark 5 and verse 21, you will find that the brothers and the family of our Lord Jesus Christ actually Believe that Jesus is out of his mind. It's a way of saying that Jesus is mad, a mad man. Crazy! Something wrong with his thinking. Because he claimed to be the Son of God. How can he be the Son of God? He's our brother. We slept with him. We went to school with him. We played with him. We ate the same food. And now he says the Son of God. 
He's a crazy man. He's out of his mind. The brothers only came to be convinced and converted that he is indeed the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the promised Messiah. After, only after the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then they became Christians. And one of them, James, became a leader in the, among the people of God in the early church. The same thing happened, brothers and sisters, you'll remember later on with one of his 12 apostles, a man by the name of Thomas, also had problem being convinced that the Lord Jesus Christ had died and rose again from the dead. And what happened? He only came to believe that Jesus has died and rose again from the dead after he saw with his own eyes and touched our Lord with his own hands. Then he said there in the Gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 28, My Lord and my God, that was his heart felt conclusion and confession that indeed now I believe wholeheartedly you are my Lord and you are my God. But the town, hometown, the people of the hometown of our Lord at this point did not accept that the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ is indeed who he claimed to be. The same happened for Paul. How Paul was against those who believed that Jesus is Lord and God and the Messiah. He was not just a person who, who did not believe. He was a, a very active anti and a persecutor of the church. He only became a believer when he was confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ while he was on the road to the town of Mat the Mat Damascus in order to persecute the Christians there. We are told in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 and verse 20 these words. After Paul became a Christian, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. You see there, brothers and sisters, now that he has witnessed the Lord's, the risen Lord, he was convinced. And so he publicly confessed that he is the Son of God and he actually paid the price for making that confession and was zealous in promoting it during his lifetime. He died a Christian martyr in the city of Rome later on in his later years. Not just a good teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ claimed not just to be a good teacher who teaches people to do good, no, brothers and sisters, he never claimed to be a good teacher. He claimed to be the Lord and God. And he claimed to be the one that is come to give the only hope that this dying world needs. He claimed to be the one who died in order to be the substitute for you. In order to be the one who takes away your sin and all the misery that your sin would indeed inflict in your lives. He came to be the one who claimed to be the Lord who will lead you out of darkness into the marvelous light of God. Brothers, sisters, do you believe these things? This claim of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You need to believe because unless you believe, you will never, never be able to see God face to face. The second point I want to draw your attention to from these six verses is this. Not only that the Lord Jesus Christ is really fully a man, He wants you to tell others. You are to tell others who the Lord Jesus is. You remember earlier on in chapter 5 of Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 5, you remember that there in chapter 5, He helped and delivered and graciously saved a man who was demon-possessed in the town of Gadarenes. And then, after being rescued by our Lord, he wanted to follow our Lord to leave the place and ever be uh, with our Lord wherever he would go. He wanted to serve our Lord. But the Lord said to him in chapter 5 and verse 19 and verse 20, look at what he says there, Go home to your friend and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all who heard him marveled. 
the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, is calling you to do the same with your loved ones, with your hometowns, with your relatives, with your uncles and aunties, with your cousins, with your nieces and your nephews. Brothers and sisters, the question is, have you told your neighbor anything at all about the Lord Jesus Christ? All these years, have you even mentioned the name of Jesus in front of them? And do they even know that you are a Christian? Have you told them what great things the Lord has done for you? Or, by your silence, are you saying that the Lord has never done anything for you? You find the examples of Cornelius, if you've done with me now, to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10. Look at what you're told there in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, and verse 24. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, and verse 24. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them, Peter and his companion, and Cornelius had called together his relatives and close friends, not just relatives and neighbors, but also close friends. But what about you, brothers and sisters? Tell me very honestly, what about you? You even find in this passage that we have just read, these six verses, you even find the word that they were offended by our Lord. Isn't that exactly what you are afraid of? You dare not tell your friends and your loved ones, your relatives about the Lord. Why? Frankly, because you are afraid that you will offend people. Should you let them, this fear, prevent you from saving them? Would you rather that they go to hell because you do not wish them to think badly of you? During this lifetime, what kind of person are you, brothers and sisters, that you are seeing your relatives and your friends, close friends, drinking poison and be killed because you do not wish to tell them and warn them because you are so scared that they will think that you are lying and you are bluffing them and tricking them. I think you are a very heartless person if that is your attitude because you would tell your relatives and close friends about a sales, about a good deal, about a vacation. You may even invite them to join you on an overseas trip when it is available soon. Why not tell them what God, what great things the Lord has done for you? Why not share with them some of your Christian experience? What is so shameful, what is so offensive about that to you? You see, the grateful man of Gadarenes, he proclaimed, as you are told there, as I read for you earlier, in Decapolis, all that Jesus had done for him. Mark chapter 5 and verse 20. You are not telling people about other people and about other things. The Lord is calling you to testify and to witness to others about what God has done for you. With the intention that by telling them your personal experience, they too will come to marvel and to follow you in the following and trusting of Jesus Christ our Lord. You are called to do the same with your relatives and close friends. It is a difficult task and the Lord experiences it. As a man, the Lord experiences it with his own folks. And so, it is not as if the Lord didn't know that it is a hard work. It is hard and it is difficult to witness to your immediate families, especially those who grew up with you, or especially those who saw you growing up. It's hard, but the Lord did not, did not turn a blind eye to their needs. Look at what you are told there in Mark chapter 6, verse 3 to verse 6. It says, so they were offended. The word there offended means scandalized. It is scandalous. It is ridiculous. It's offensive. How can you say you are the son of God? You are the son of Mary. How can you say you are the son of God? You are a man. You grew up in our midst. You cannot deceive us. You can block people in other towns and villages. But we... We know you. We were with you. We, some of us, we even saw you growing up. It, it was very offensive for them. Why did the Lord say so? If you look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 
and verse 18. Look at what we are told there when we tell people the gospel. We are told there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness to them. What do you, you want me to believe in somebody who died 2,000 years ago on a cross and that he died on that cross 2,000 years ago, long before I was even born? And that he, I, he can save me? It's ridiculous. You are mad. You are out of your mind. You are like Jesus, out of your mind. And I am offended by you for saying all these stupid things. That's exactly what happened. No wonder the brothers of our Lord, and surely included some of his sisters, if not all his sisters, they were offended and they did not believe in him until after his death and resurrection. And they could not deny the fact that he actually died and he died a real death. And that he rose again from the dead because they saw him. That's why they could believe in him now. That he is who he claimed to be. However, brothers and sisters, you realize that though it was difficult to reach his neighbors, his relatives, and his close friends, the Lord Jesus Christ persevered. He did not give them up because of his fear or because of the fear of offending people. You see, brothers and sisters, the Holy Bible tells you this, that you should only stop if people rejected your message repeatedly. Repeatedly and after many attempts by you. That's what you learn, isn't it? In the Gospel, in the, uh, in, in the Word of God, in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13, in the example of Paul in Acts 13, verse 46, you read, It was necessary that the Word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Only after many repeated rejection did the Apostle Paul turn to others. You find it the same here in the, in the example of our Lord. If you come back to Mark chapter 6 and look at verse 6, it tells us there that he marveled because of their unbelief. Then, and only after then, he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. The Lord started with them whom he considered to be his close one and his neighbors. But when they repeatedly rejected him, then, after that, he went to the surrounding cities and villages. And that is the example Paul picked up and Paul followed. And that is what we must do too. I suspect that many of you never even spoke properly to any of your relative or close friend, but you have already given them up. You have already condemned them to hell. You never attempt, brothers and sisters, to tell them anything. Now, I do not want to give you a wrong impression, but recently there was somebody who was talking to a friend or, or hearing the groaning of a friend and the friend was sharing with this lady now about her problem. She, she found herself in, as a third party in, in a relationship. She, she was about to be the one who, who caused a divorce because he, she, she had fallen in love with a married man. And the sad thing is that this person is actually known to the husband and to the wife and was actually quite close to the woman, the wife. And yet she became like, for a, a third party. And what was this other person trying to do? When the friend said that, no, I'm a third party. Instead of telling the friend it's a sin. Instead of telling the friend it's wrong. Oh, the friend will just listen. And will just sympathize with the struggle of this sinful, wicked woman who is about to destroy a marriage. The person refused to say what is right. Why? Because the person refused to be an offense to the one, oh, I just glad at listening you. Ah, uh, who am I? Who, who am I to say what's right and what's wrong? Uh, I, I just listen. Uh, I, uh, just hear, uh, just be a friend to this person. Brothers and sisters, this is what is wrong with the modern world. Nobody wants to do what is right. Everybody wants to do what is popular. 
You are not serving God. You are the destroyer of marriage. You are, whatever happened, you will have your hand full of blood. Because you could have stopped it. You could have prevented it. You could have saved a soul and saved a marriage. But you turn a blind eye. You have brought yourself to this modern wicked spirit of don't offend anybody. That is not definitely the example you learn from Paul or our blessed Savior himself. He went to his town folks and he told them. He knew that it would be difficult for them to understand. He knew that it would be difficult for them to accept that the person who grew up in their midst is the promised Savior that God has said that he would send. He knew. Nonetheless, he went and told them. I hope that all of you, brothers and sisters, with relatives and friends who are still unconverted, that you will do the same and have the same heart and same desire to save the lost. We come to our final point this morning from these six verses from the Gospel of Mark chapter 6. You learn here, brothers and sisters, that you can trust in the sympathy of our Lord Jesus Christ. A man, only a true man, a true human being can understand and sympathize with the struggles of a fellow human being, isn't it? Isn't that the reason why people find it more comfortable to talk to a, a recovered alcoholic or a recovered uh, drug addict, whatever uh, the person may be struggling with? You want to tap on the experience of somebody who, who, who also went through the same journey and came out victorious. The Lord was tempted in all ways by sin. And he came out all victorious because he has no sin. Do you not want to go to him and say, Lord, I heard about all these things about you. You are a human being. You went through all the temptation that I would ever go through. And you are victorious. I want to be victorious. I want to be somebody who conquered alcohol, conquered drug, conquered all the sinful inclinations. That's exactly the attitude here, brothers and sisters. Why Mark tells you that Jesus is fully man? The people of the hometown of Jesus, well, they were offended by him. They could not understand the claim that he is the son of God, but they have no problem accepting this, that he is fully a man. He has a human family. We are told that in chapter 6 of Mark and verse 3. The, the, the composition of his human family, the mother. Now, the Joseph is not mentioned, not only is he, Joseph not the true father of the Lord Jesus, but by this point in time, church history tells us Joseph was already dead. Died. He, had, he had passed on, he has died earlier than this point in time. The Holy Bible proclaimed, brothers and sisters, that the Lord is fully God and fully man. And it's important for you to understand what Mark is trying to do. To remind you again and again that the Lord Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. And it's important for you to understand that He is fully man. Only a man can understand a man. And you can trust the Lord Jesus Christ to know your problems and your struggles. Because He was and He is Amen. As we are told there, if you turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. The Apostle Paul tells us about the Lord Jesus who has ascended to heaven. He is in heaven now and he tells us that as the Lord Jesus is in heaven at the moment, he said, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The man, not the spirit, not the angel. Not the alien, but the man. It is a man who is in heaven preparing a place for his people. It is a man who sits at the right hand of God, representing his people as their high priest. As we are told there, brothers and sisters, if you turn down to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, that is exactly the point that Paul is making. In Hebrews 4, verse 15 to verse 16, you read, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin, because he faced a temptation like an alcoholic who faced alcohol, but he faced it and then he came out victorious. He was not tempted. 
He did not give in to his temptation. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's the motivation. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers, sisters, whoever you are listening in this morning, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever human problems, whatever human struggles you may have, come to Him. He understands. He is fully man. He has experienced everything. And He can associate with you and He can sympathize with you. Come to Him and see in Him your helper, your savior. See in Him someone who is your rescuer that you may find grace to help in time of need as the Holy Bible tells you. We are told in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 to cast all your care upon Him for He cares for you. The word that care means to cast all your anxiety upon Him. Are you anxious about anything? Your, your exams? Your, your health? Your, your business condition? Your, 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 your work situation? You are you're worried about the COVID-19 whether you will get infected and die as a result? Beloved brothers and sisters, what is your anxiety? The Lord understands all your worries and all your depression because He was tempted by all these things and yet He came out victorious. Surely you won the secret to victory. And here you find in our Lord who knows and holds all these experiences in His hands. Do you have any relationship problems with your family members? Are you having a hard time with your parents or your siblings, your brothers and sisters or, or your neighbors or your hometown people? Look at what we are told here in this passage. The Lord had human problems. These people were offended by Him and His own brother refused to believe in His claims. They refused to believe in Him. What other things do you need to say? They actually came to the conclusion that the Lord Jesus Christ is out of His mind. What harder thing to say, brothers and sisters? What other more difficult experience or relationship problems you can have with your family members and neighbors and friends and close friends? The Lord understands all these things. The Lord understands how difficult it is for you to go through all these difficulties and misery caused by sin. That is why God sent His Son to be the propitiation for your sin. That is why Christ has come to be the substitute for your sin. Why do you think God sent His Son to die? Because the wages of sin is there. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Will you come this morning to see in the Lord Jesus Christ someone who can understand you fully? Will you tell Him all your struggles? Will you come to Him? Because He's fully God. He's able to help you. Nothing is impossible with God. And at the same time, He's fully man. He can fully sympathize with you. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ is the only hope for this world. For there is no others. There is nobody else who is fully God and fully man. Some teachers of religions claim to be a good teacher teaching people the good, the, the good things in life and how to be good. They tell you how to find God. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not teaching you to find God. The Lord Jesus Christ is teaching you that He is God. Nothing is impossible. He has power over all creation. And at the very same time, He's fully man. He's able to identify with all the difficulties of your life. You find here in these six verses, the teaching that Christ reached out to His people in His hometown. Many of these people saw Him growing up Many of these people grew up with Him. They knew that He is a human being with a human family. But brothers and sisters, they could not accept Him to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world. It was difficult to convince people like them. And the Lord knew, but the Lord never abandoned them. So you shouldn't abandon anyone. You shouldn't be afraid that they will be offended by you. Out of love, in all kindness and loveliness, brothers and sisters, tell them, tell them, tell them the hope. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. Tell them your testimony of salvation. Tell them, tell them, tell them all the hope. 
Tell them the Christian worldview. Tell them to look at the world the way that a Christian looks at the world, that they too may come to know the Lord and own Him as their Lord and Savior. They will die. They will perish in hell if they will not hear you. And I'm sure, brothers and sisters, you are stirred. You want to be sent. You want to represent God. You remember what Jesus said to the man who was demon possessed in Caribbeans. And you want to do what Jesus wants you to do. And so this morning, I call you to this. Brothers and sisters, go and tell others what Jesus has done. Let us pray.